question from the gentleman in the audience. Uh, my question is directed to the program manager individuals. Why are you know, certain people who are in support of the current definition of marriage, such as the fine gentleman on the left, simply judged as homophobic, hateful, bigoted? Why, like, when they're simply engaging in debate, why does the kind of the opposition simply get labelled with these labels? Shouldn't, shouldn't like, we be open to debate? Absolutely. Well, I, um, I met both of these guys recently. Um, we were hanging out in the, in the green room and um, Dr. Van Gelb played the cello for us. I didn't experience any hatred at all. I didn't find them as particularly abrasive people. I think that a lot of the time, gay and lesbian people, I, well, I can't speak about more diverse people than that because I'm, I'm just a gay guy, but um, I think we experience a lot of hatred. And then, on the other hand, you have people presenting nice arguments for what we experience as hatred. And that's, from my experience, that's where the connection is. It's like, well, here's an argument that's justifying things that I experience as hatred. Like, to me, you were saying we should stand up to bullying. Well, I think the some of the worst bullying I've ever experienced is that I'm not allowed to get married. So, when things like that that I experience are being justified by people, it's like, it's really strange to, to see a smiling face arguing for your oppression and wanting to be your friend. It's, it's, it's bizarre. I think that's probably where that reaction comes from. The, the idea that this is somehow targeted to oppress homosexuals is just, it's just not the case. I mean, the, the reason, the, we, we realise why the reason that marriage, the institution of marriage, well, institutions of all forms, whether it be educational, healthcare, arise when there's important social goods that need to be protected and preserved, and institution arises ways to protect them. Now, what was the important social good that the institution of marriage arose to protect? Was the reality that men and women having sex together makes babies, and babies don't come out all fully dependent and fully made, and so the institution, from the sort of state, government, society level, was there to ensure that husbands and wives stick together with their kids. That was the reason, that's why we get the norms of exclusivity, of permanence, of fidelity. All these things are guarded in because of this is the sort of relationship that needs those things. Relationships between two men, or two women, or three men, there's no reason in and of themselves, as a principal reason, why they have to be permanent, any more than our normal friendships have to be permanent or exclusive. In fact, all of our friendships are enriched when we have more friends. But why is it the case that within marriage, only between a man and woman, we have these expectations of, and with good reasons, of permanence, exclusivity, and monogamy. It is only because relationships between men and women have the orientation to children. Whether or not that actually comes about, that doesn't matter. But the relationships still retain that direction, and therefore the norms make sense of it, and the whole reason why the state is interested in the first place makes sense of it. The state doesn't care who our best friends are. It doesn't, there's no reason why we need to go to the state to mark our best friends. But there is a reason why the state gets involved. The more personal a relationship, the less the state is involved. The more public the relationship, the more the state's involved. Which is why the government regulates businesses, finances, all these sorts of things. That's why the conjugal interview explains why the law is hooked into and has an interest in marriage. Because of its connection to children and family life. It's obviously not the reason why most of us get married in the first place. We don't think of it like that. But that's the reason why the law is interested in regulating. If I can just answer that. Look, I think there is a public good that the state is trying to protect in marriage. And one of those is having children, but it's not the only one. If it were the only one, the 2004 Amendment Act would have said marriage is the voluntary union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others. Also, if you're a woman over 50, you can't get married. Also, if you're a prisoner, you can't get married. Also, if you're infertile, you can't get married. If you don't plan on having kids, you can't get married. But it doesn't have those exceptions. It's only same-sex couples. Which leads me to the point, which is that there is another public good which it acts to preserve and protect, which is the public declaration of a commitment to a shared life together. It's not this namby-pamby emotional union stuff that we've been accused of, I mean, the classic straw man argument. We're not arguing for that. We're saying that there are people out there that want to spend the rest of their lives together in a permanent union, and we think that's a very valuable and a very good thing that everyone should want same-sex couples to be able to enjoy, also for the benefit of the children that they may already have, or that they may in the future have. And while I agree that homophobia is bandied around as a word too often, and is often inaccurate to describe particular people in this debate, and no doubt that's true of our opponents here today, I still think though, that when you are making the argument 
that two people can't get married because they are biologically, just innately, incapable of having that deeper sense of love and having that commitment to a monogamous union, there is something profoundly offensive about that. I know it's not the main cause of youth suicide and suicide among gays and lesbians, but it certainly can't help. And it can't help when the kids of a gay couple are in the playground getting bullied and mistreated because our state says that their parents are second-class citizens. That can't help. Thanks, Pat. We'll just hear from Dr. Van um, But after that, I'd like to hear from somebody from the Catholic Society. Uh, just this recurring theme, which is really pretty rough, to say that if one argues the case for natural marriage and the child's right to a mum and a dad, that we are somehow culpable for young, desperate men killing themselves, is a very long bow and a very, a very unpleasant one. And look, just let me throw some actual psychological findings into the mix for your consideration. Um, for example, a very large study published in the British Journal of Psychiatry in 2003 addressed this very question about the alleged an increase in bullying based on being gay and also the psychological consequences of depression. And they pointed out that in their large study of a thousand gay and heterosexual men and women, there was no increase whatsoever in bullying reported by gay men, whether psychological or physical, whether at school or subsequently, compared to the same matched group of heterosexual men. They all got bullied a lot but they got bullied for lots of reasons. At school you get bullied because you're too smart, you're too dumb, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're too whatever. And you get bullied for being gay when you're not gay. I was bullied for being gay when I was not gay at school. It was horrible. But I wasn't, I was just gentle. I was a musician, I was a, 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 a scholar, I led the chapel choir. Of course you get bullied for being gay, and it's not nice, but it, it doesn't mean that there's this vast statistical difference between the suffering of gay people at school and the others. And very importantly, concerning the, the, the question of subsequent psychological distress, this report says this, it may be that prejudice in society against gay men and lesbians leads to greater psychological distress, fair enough. Conversely, gay men and lesbians may have lifestyles that make them vulnerable to psychological disorder. Such lifestyles may include use of, increased use of drugs and alcohol. Well, look at the facts. In Australia, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, two years ago, found that the prevalence of illicit drug use by homosexuals was more than double that of heterosexuals, 34% to 14%, while the rate of excessive alcohol intake was 25% to 16%. Now, such behaviours are risk factors for depression, and they are risk factors for suicide behaviour. But are they somebody else's fault? In Canada, where gay marriage was legalised in 2005, homosexual lobbyists in 2009, four years later, were still citing drug and alcohol abuse as being several times higher amongst gays. So, are we to understand that substance abuse by you heterosexuals here is your own fault, but substance abuse on the other side by homosexuals is the fault of homophobic society? I don't think that warrants much a serious consideration. Maybe we'd use a little bit less drugs if we could get married, so we had something else to do with our time. <laughs> That's a good point. But in my clinical experience as a doctor, and I've never had a homosexual patient say that their inability to marry was a factor in their suffering. But what was a factor in their suffering was the sense of something has gone wrong deep inside, that's their perception. The deep uh, distress over what one lad called this ball and chain I have to drag around with me, his obsessive compulsive sexual behaviour. And another one who was so angry at what had been done to him as a young man when he was abused by an uncle, which made him think that he was homosexual. These are the things that cause the suffering, as well as unpleasant people in society. But to try and portray it as being the suffering primarily due to a debate over same-sex marriage is a very unjust uh, accusation. David, are you saying you disagree with the findings of the American Psychological Association on the psychological benefits of same-sex marriage? Are you saying you disagree with their findings? I'm saying, sorry, hypothetically, let's just say the case that that, the well, that getting married increases the well-being of the social, psychological state of people 
what happens if three people or four people come and say, no, no, no he's right this off, but if, if what makes a marriage and what should give people the legal recognition of marriage is the benefits they give psychologically, the security gives certain things, then why, why are we denying those same sorts of psychological benefits to more than three people? I think we're going down a slippery slope here. Can I hear from the ladies <laughs> and oh, Hi, my name is Jess. My question is for Mr. Bateman. You spoke earlier about um, having trouble understanding why we believe issues like surrogacy, etc., were offensive. And I wanted to ask, personally believing that, for example, the idea of using a woman's body essentially as a farm is offensive, why you seek to enshrine into law legislation that would then essentially um, create a culture whereby um, our focus is upon um, producing life that's not done in a natural way, and in fact, producing a culture where I don't have the right to be born naturally. And could you speak as to how that's not offensive? and how that will, in fact, make us a better country? Uh, well, three things there. First of all, I hope everyone notices in this debate how all the arguments that are directed at us aren't actually about same-sex marriage, they're about things like surrogacy, things like polygamy. It's actually, no one really seems to have a compelling justification for why they're opposed to same-sex marriage itself. And I wonder, as a hypothetical, whether or not these guys would be opposed to same-sex marriage if, in a hypothetical scenario, we said you can get, you can have same-sex marriage, but you can't have any children and we'll never allow polygamy. I wonder as a hypothetical whether or not they'd still disagree with it. I have a feeling they would because the churches have always opposed it and these arguments seem to be a new invention uh, as they realise how offensive the main argument actually is. The second thing as to whether or not I think surrogacy is offensive. Um, no, I don't. I think for children out there uh, that have uh, been born through non-traditional means, whether it's reproductive technology, surrogacy, have parents via adoption, I think that in overwhelming majority of cases, uh, they have enjoyed the gift of life, which whether you're religious or not, surely is the most important thing. And not only that, they have the gift of loving parents that have gone to extraordinary means to have those children in their lives and to give them a good shot at life. I think that's a very valuable thing. And thirdly, as to whether it's good for our country, I think more children the merrier. I think uh, everyone on this stage agrees with that. Uh, one response, now we've got another question. Uh, I think one thing I find very interesting about these debates uh, is it's fascinating that the other side thinks uh, that there is just possibly no reason why people throughout the ages have held the marriages between a man and a woman. But it's just somehow just this mere tradition that now we're finally the enlightened in the 20th century realize that, oh, of course it's going to be expanded to more. That there's no reason in principle. The California Prop 8 trials, one of the lead um, opponents of same-sex marriage, said this, so there, there just is no argument, it's just a catchphrase. Marriage just is a man and a woman. I just find that really fascinating because if this argument that I'm presenting is new and is uh, sort of recent, then well then so, uh, so is Socrates and Plato and all these other people and all these religious traditions and even non-religious traditions throughout the ages have always seen a special importance about binding men and women together because of the sorts of unions that they are and to keep together with their kids. Now, th that seems like a pretty important reason to me, because if we left men to their own, history and our own personal experience may show what just happens there. Women bear kids. What happens? Do kids self-sufficient? No, they need their husband, they need the, the fathers and the mother to stick together and look after them. Now, that, that's the reason why the state's interested in them, as I said before. But there's, a very, there's very good reasons here, and all of them, none, none of them have been ever brought about out of animus to homosexuals or anything like this, as I said in ancient Greece, highly favourable to gay relationships, still held, still held this view of marriage. So this is the idea that it's bigoted, homophobic, outdated, or some sort of concoction that we've sort of devised to sort of fix the problem at the moment, or that we're somehow fixated on homosexuality, just does not fit the historical facts.